right now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Greg Corbett, who holds a BSc and MSc from the U of A, and a second from the University of Brussels. He is now a professor of surgery at the U of A, and also serves as director of the Human Islet Quality Control Laboratory, and is an AHFMR scholar. The main objectives of Dr. Corbett's research is to develop a more accessible source of insulin producing tissue for transplantation into patients with type 1 diabetes and to devise a strategy to transplant this tissue without the need for continuous immunosuppression. Please welcome him. Good afternoon and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, what I'd like to do is give a presentation showing what is islet transplantation where are we in the clinic, but more importantly, where are we going? I always like to show this slide when I give a talk because when you really think about it, it's been almost 90 years since insulin was discovered. And I would imagine that Banting and Bess would roll over in their graves if they realized that this is still the main therapy used for patients with type 1 diabetes. We haven't found a better therapy yet. One of the reasons why this is important, because if you're a patient with type 1 diabetes, when you take insulin during the day, your blood sugars still fluctuate. Not like a person without type 1 diabetes whose blood sugars stay at a relatively constant value throughout the day. Even though you're taking insulin, they fluctuate, and that is known to cause the complications like damage to the kidney, cardiovascular disease, blindness. So we need to come up with a better form of therapy for these patients besides daily insulin injections. So one approach that people have used in the past was, well, why not transplant the pancreas and replace the pancreas that is defective? They have done this in a number of cases worldwide. However, this is a very invasive surgical procedure with a high incidence of morbidity and some mortality and the patients are in the ICU for a few days. So it's a rather invasive procedure, something you simply would not want to use for a young juvenile diabetic. So we need to come up with a better non-invasive procedure. Well, researchers years ago thought, well, why transplant the whole pancreas? Why don't we just transplant the islets? Or those are the cells that are the insulin-producing cells. So here's a schematic diagram of a human pancreas. And these islets are clusters of about 1,000 to 2,000 cells. And they are scattered like tiny grains throughout the pancreas. They make up about 2% of the whole pancreas. The other function of the pancreas is to produce digestive enzymes, which is secreted into your small intestine to help you digest your food. So the pancreas has two functions to secrete insulin, and to manage your, your digestion. So what researchers did is over the years is came up with methods of trying to isolate these islets or tiny grains of sand from this whole pancreas and to transplant just those. So that's what they were able to do. And so instead of transplanting this whole pancreas, they were able to isolate the islets, which are shown here, so you can imagine transplanting that is a lot less invasive than transplanting this whole pancreas. So basically what they've done is we don't go in and we do not transplant these insulin producing cells into the pancreas, but rather the patient goes into the radiology suite or where you get an x-ray. They're not put to sleep. They're given just a local anesthetic like you would when you get your teeth fixed. And they basically, an x-ray uh, technician or the radiologist will put a needle between the ribs. And by using the x-ray, they can see where it's going and they feed it into a blood vessel that goes to the liver. They inject the islets and the islets go into the liver and that's where they make their home and they stay there. So here's an example of a daily blood glucose of a patient with type 1 diabetes taking daily insulin injections. This is where they want to be with their blood sugars, right between these two lines. And you could see that even though they are taking insulin, 
their blood sugars fluctuate quite a bit. So we need to try to get those blood sugars right between here. This is the same patient after an islet transplantation. And you can see now that once we put those insulin producing cells in their liver, they're able to respond to the glucose in the blood, secrete insulin that keeps these blood sugars right between here where we want them. And hopefully this will prevent further complications such as damage to the eye. So we feel that we were able to achieve good blood sugar levels. However, the problem is, is when we take a look at these patients over five years, we can see that about 15% of them are off daily insulin. The rest had to go back on daily insulin injections. The reasons for that is they're on drugs that help them not reject the foreign insulin producing cells. These drugs could be toxic to the insulin producing cells. thus they lose function with time. There also may be the fact that the liver may not be the best place to put them. So we need to develop strategies to try to improve this. Even though they're back on daily insulin injections, this is not necessarily to be considered a failure. These patients are taking less insulin than they did before. They've got better control of their blood sugars so they have a better quality of life. So maybe not the goal should not be completely off daily insulin, but if we can get better control of their sugars, that may in itself help prevent the complications. Nonetheless, we still need to do a lot of basic research to, to improve our success. So just to give you a summary, just to, it's islet transplantation, it is a successful cell transplant therapy. You may not know here in Edmonton, the program was initiate, initiated by Ray Rajat, who's an electrical engineer. He did his PhD in biomedical engineering. And then what he did is he started to, to hire or recruit basic scientists like myself, as well as surgeon scientists. And he formed a team. And it was this team that was able to make the Edmonton Protocol. So the point I'd like to make is usually in science, success is not usually because of one person, it's because of a team working together. So what do we have to do to achieve, to produce insulin independence in young patients with type 1 diabetes? Well, the first thing we need to do is in Canada, we get about 250 human organs. So when people donate their organs, we get the, the human pancreas to isolate the islets. However, we only are successful in isolating enough islets in maybe 30% of the cases. So if you do the math, we clearly do not have enough human tissue to meet the number of patients with type 1 diabetes. So we need to come up with a better supply of insulin producing cells to transplant more patients. The other thing we need to do is we know to prevent rejection of these transplanted islets, we need to give them anti-rejection drugs, which are not necessarily good for you because they make you susceptible to infection. There uh, is the fear of possibly developing some type of a cancer. So we need to either eliminate this or come up with strategies that we have better drugs that aren't harmful on the patients. So what I'd like to talk about is how are we trying to improve the source? So like I said, we have a very limited availability in the number of human pancreases. Well, what's other possibilities? Well, why not use animals? One such animal is the pig. The pig has been considered as a source for hearts, for kidneys, for livers, and also for insulin producing cells. They breed rapidly. We can have large litters. We breed them for food consumption. Why not take the pancreases to get the insulin producing cells? Other approaches in, in the area is stem cells. This is a very popular thing that you hear in the media. So a lot of people are putting a lot of their energy in their research 
to take a stem cell and get it to become a cell that can produce insulin that we could use for transplantation. So what we've done in, in my lab here at the Alberta Diabetes Institute is what we did is we developed a procedure to isolate insulin producing cells from newborn piglets. The reason why we picked newborn pigs is because many people spent years trying to isolate these cells from adult pigs but did not have a lot of success. So we went and worked with the neonatal pig. Over the years, this is in about a matter of about 15 years of research, first we were able to cure diabetes in mice with these pig cells. Then we were able to cure diabetes in, a, in adult pigs. Then we worked with the group in Atlanta where we shipped these pig insulin producing cells to Atlanta and they transplanted them into diabetic monkeys. We use the monkey because it's the best model that we could use before we take the next step to clinical trials with patients with type 1 diabetes. In this study, we were able to cure diabetes in these monkeys. So what we're doing now is to try to develop a protocol to prevent rejection of these cells that would, could be safely used in patients with type 1 diabetes. So we feel now we have a really good source of insulin producing cells. We just have to come up with a better, safer transplant procedure. The other approach is why not stem cells? This is another area of research in my lab, but this is also something that's being done throughout the world in many research labs. Why stem cells? Because in theory, stem cells have the potential, if we can coach them in the right direction, to become many different types of tissues. So you could you imagine if we had a big pool of stem cells, we could make skin, we could make neurons, we could use them to help people who have spinal cord injury, or in, in our case, to produce cells that make insulin. So one of the questions is, are adult stem cells in the pancreas? Well, in science, there's always difference of opinion. Some researchers out there say, no, there is not a stem cell. Other researchers say that there are. I'm in the belief that there are. So one of the things that we are doing is we are, when we isolate these insulin producing cells from the human pancreas, there's other tissue that we don't use to transplant. We're trying to identify a stem cell in that tissue that we normally throw away and don't use. So could you imagine if we come up with a procedure to coach these cells to become insulin producing cells, we would have a good supply of insulin producing cells. The problem is, is we don't even know in in natural embryology or when a fetus is developing, we don't know how these cells become insulin producing cells. So basically what we're doing now is we're guessing. We're trying this, see if it works, just trying this, see if it works. And the field is, is slowly advancing, but I think that this is <coughs> gonna be the much longer term solution. This is not gonna happen for a number of years. So the other question is, is can cells outside the pancreas become insulin producing cells? Well, in your bone marrow, you have a pool of stem cells. And researchers are finding out now that, that using different strategies, you can get these bone marrow cells to migrate to a diabetic mouse pancreas. They go there in that pancreas and they become insulin producing cells. So this is another strategy that is out there in the field. So I believe that pancreatic stem cells it exist, but we'll first we still have to identify them. Then will become the challenge of making them become insulin producing cells. So like I say, they're not identified. How do we make them into islets? But more importantly, if we learn about how a stem cell develops into an insulin producing cell, the holy grail would be not to do a transplant, but to get 
the patient's own stem cells in their pancreas to become insulin-producing cells. That way, it's non-invasive, but that would be the holy grail, but we still need to learn about the developmental pathways. So if we come up with these pig cells, we come up with stem cells, and we want to go into the clinic, there's something else that we need. We do this research in our, in our research lab. These labs are not designed to produce cells to go into patients. You need a special type of labs that are extremely expensive to build. So that's what I'd like to share with you is, because here at the university, we managed to ra raise $26 million to build a cell and tissue innovative research center. This will be um, a large lab that can be used for producing pig islets and stem cells, not only for diabetes, but for other diseases. This is going to be the first of its kind in Western Canada, and there's only about four others in Eastern Canada that can do this. So this is going to put us in the forefront of the, of the field. So where is this going to be located? Well, this is the Alberta Diabetes Institute where we do our research. Well, when the university built this building, they left the seventh floor vacant for this type of a laboratory. So we were lucky enough with a lot of dedicated people to write this grant to the federal government and we managed to get it. So that's going to be a reality and this lab should be built in the next two years. So it's going to have different labs in there. One is going to be to isolate pig islets. One will be used for stem cells to produce insulin producing cells. You could also have a lab that's going to develop and grow skin for burn patients. We're also going to have a researcher, Dr. Bernard, Bernard Thibault, who's got really good research going where he can take stem cells and get the lung to regenerate. So for example, when you have a premature baby, their lungs aren't developed. We can produce cells that can be used in these young patients or other patients with other lung disorders. So basically, we need to come up with a better supply, and that's where we're looking at the pig islets. We're looking at stem cells. But there's also got people in our laboratory and across the world developing strategies to prevent the rejection of these cells in a much safer manner. Thank you very much.